we go to our first witness this morning, Janine Rees. Janine, welcome to the CEDAW hearings, and please, if you would, present your witness statement. Uh, thank you, um, everyone. Um, I would like to uh, acknowledge that I'm living and working on Turrbal and Yuggera land and um, I pay my respects to Elders past and present. Um, my statement, um, I'm, I'm speaking to uh, marriage and family and particularly the family law um, system. Uh, this statement made by me sets out evidence that is true to the best of my knowledge and belief, and I make it knowing that reference may be made to it in a report of the hearings, and it may be used in an NGO submission to the CEDAW committee during Australia's upcoming ninth periodic report at CEDAW's 86th session. I have perused CEDAW and the list of issues and questions prior to the submission of the ninth periodic report of Australia, and have considered those sections relevant to my area of experience and, and expertise. My evidence will relate to marriage and family relations, in particular family law. I am aware and participate on the understanding that the CEDAW hearings will be recorded online and transmitted by live stream via YouTube technology permitting. I am 53 years of age. My background is as a primary school teacher and I have three children now aged 20, 17 and 14. <clears throat> I have been a small business creator and owner, uh, one a construction business and one business where I worked as an education consultant. I have run in the 2020 federal election on a platform of highlighting the dangers of family law, as well as police failures and the continued systemic failures faced by women escaping violence. I'm a victim survivor advocate for reform in all areas where women and children are harmed and discriminated against. I am a victim survivor lived experience advocate of domestic violence and sexual violence. My focus for urgent change at the response phase to domestic family and sexual violence is family law and policing and how they interact to fail victim survivors. I am advocating for the immediate emancipation of children who are court ordered to live with an abusive parent and to end moratoriums on the protective parent. I made a submission to the Special Rapporteur on Family Law and Parental Alienation. I spoke about the harms that have come out of my experience of the family law system and the harm to my children. I had no idea of how broken the systems were or how patriarchal they were until I lived through the experience. That was the first time that I became aware of the same thing that was happening in my home and in my community in the systems. The objectification of women, the mistreatment of women, the silencing of women, the ignoring of women. It was the same in the systems that I, I needed to seek protection from in the police and the legal system. Then after going through it myself, I started to meet other women who had been through post-separation and systems abuse and their stories were exactly the same as mine. They were disbelieved. They were all victim survivors of, of domestic and sexual violence. Many of them had their children removed from them on a full-time basis because they disclosed abuse. And that was what, um, we are, what women are threatened with, women and children are threatened with. I know hundreds of women now in Australia <clears throat> and many more worldwide. It's a repeating phenomenon. The family court treats women the same in various countries. I receive messages almost daily through social media um, and from women who are going through the same thing that I did. It seems to be such a protected area and lots of money is being made from perpetrators using the family law system and mothers trying to protect their children. Australia is not meeting its obligations under CEDAW. Um, focusing on the family law system, um, many changes were made in the John Howard era um, and lots of men's rights activists were working to eliminate the progress that had been made for women and children in order to maintain the position of the father as the pinnacle of the family. Since that time in Australia, things have been getting worse for women and children in family law and especially in the family court. 
there are huge numbers of children who have been ordered to live with fathers who are sexually abusing them. Women are having all their assets stripped from them and proceedings are dragged out for years, sometimes decades. Whole childhoods are being stolen through protracted family law proceedings. In family court, there is no recognition of gender-based violence. The ignoring of domestic, family and sexual violence is the same in all of the cases that I know of. Hundreds of victims, hundreds of victims of family violence. Evidence is not being allowed to be filed, let alone recognised. I had a domestic violence protection order um, and my children were listed on it uh, and that was not recognised in the system. It, domestic family and sexual violence is being covered up in the family court. It's getting worse. The dis discrimination I experienced in the family law system was um, life-changing. As a woman, I have experienced continued sexual harassment. I endured a 30-year relationship of discrimination and abuse and sexual violence. And then to have that same discrimination and oppression play out again in a government system was torturous. A system that is meant to protect and provide justice traumatised my children and I further. The changes that we are seeing in the last five years um, we now have a federal judicial commission on the horizon. So that's a huge improvement. That has been uh, something that's been talked about for a very long time. We have the NACC, the Anti-Corruption Commission, that will oversee government systems and individuals who are harming women and children. However, all the women that I know that have gone through the family court system have sent complaints um, and they've all received the same template back, generic templates back. The abuse um, of children in the family court is being ignored. The Lighthouse model that has recently been launched um, and claimed that there has been in, an independent study endorsing it, um, but the women going through the family court system have seen no difference through the Lighthouse project. The misogyny is still very common amongst judges lawyers and barristers working in the system uh, and we see the same in policing. In Queensland we have had a women's safety task force shining a light on how police failures have impacted the safety of women. The Queensland Police Services inquiry highlighted the misogyny in the Queensland police force and highlighted how often victim survivors of domestic violence are completely ignored. Uh, we have a, a survivor advocate Karen Isles exposing the level of police failures for victims of sexual violence where reports are taken and no investigation is carried out. Small changes in those areas and the family law bill to reform the family law system is a start, but it doesn't change the foundations of a patriarchal and discriminatory system. Australia is um, failing to meet um, CEDAW's obligations um, through the, the discrimination that women have faced um, with police. That's the first layer. Through police failures, women's lives are destroyed. They can't work, can't earn money, can't look after children. The perpetrator is free to stalk and abuse and continue their reign of terror. The impacts are nothing short of destroyed lives. Police failures end up with women being murdered. The impact of these failures is one woman dead every week. Most of the women I know have lost their homes through family law abuse. Most of them have lost between $50,000 to $1 million defending their children. Women can't get legal support through a broken legal aid system. Women's entire lives are shattered by leaving violence, which is why so many return. It's the destruction of a woman's life when she leaves an abusive relationship and the punishment and vengeance that comes after that is that needs to be addressed. The choice to stay or leave, currently, it's not safe to stay, but it's not safe to leave. What choices do we have? And Professor Anne Summers recently released her report titled The Choice, Violence or Poverty, which is largely due to family law failures and policing failures. If I had known the system would would escalate and, uh, sorry, if I'd known the abuse would escalate and extend through systems after leaving, 
I honestly believe I could have protected my children better from within the relationship, which is a shocking reality. What needs to change now and how these changes can best be achieved? The family court pathway for post-separation, coercive control and abuse needs to be shut down without a doubt. Everything that the family court is built on <clears throat> is patriarchal and abusive and replicates the abusive system of coercive control we have tried to escape. The family court is coercive control and you can't reform that. We must end it by calling it out. If you have a misogynist biased judge, you have no hope. It's Judge Lotto. The system is abusive by design and how and um, and adversarial by nature. There needs to be a trauma-informed, survivor-centric legal system with a feminist lens based on respect, equality, and most of all, safety. Redress for victim survivors is, is urgent. There needs to be urgent legal and police intervention for children who are living with perpetrators of abuse. It is a crisis of unbelievable proportions. This is an, and this is imperative. Redress for women who have lost everything financially so that they can have some semblance of normal life. There needs to be support for women's housing and it can't be just waiting for social housing to be built. There need to be incentives for landlords in rent to buy scenarios or the government can buy the homes that have been accumulated. Give, it, give landlords tax incentives to, um, as such as no capital gains tax to sell properties especially to victims of domestic violence. But mostly fund victims to stay in their own homes and remove the perpetrator. Banks need to support women to stay in their own homes. Banks need to prevent revenge debt and women from inheriting bad credit ratings from perpetrators. The financial system does not understand how perpetrators weaponize everything. The recommendations I would like to see the CEDAW committee make um, I, I love that parental alienation has been denounced by the UN and I would like to see CEDAW recommend that no victim of family and sexual violence ever be dragged through the family law system. It's a criminal issue and we need different reporting measures. We need a wraparound system for survivors with the survivor at the centre, much like the Return Services League or the RSL that we see for war veterans. I would like to see CEDAW recommend that the perpetrator go through the system and that the victim survivors tell their stories once and then are provided with the appropriate legal support and housing support or whatever support she needs to get back on her feet and that the perpetrator is held accountable. I would also recommend that Section 121 of the Family Law Act be removed. Section 121 provides, protects perpetrator judges, lawyers and family report writers. Where um, people in the family courts are not allowed to speak about the harm being caused to them. Um, journalists are also gagged with threats of imprisonment for pu publishing anything that may identify parties. But if the family court is shut down, this probably won't be necessary. Another issue is how intertwined parenting and property are. They can't be treated as separate. The financial decimation and homelessness that most women experience through perpetrators weaponizing family law directly affects children. Homelessness directly affects the children. We need to first address the criminal aspects and then the division of property accordingly. So far, we're missing the criminal um, aspect. If the predominant aggressor is identified from the onset, the person who has acted as the main carer and attachment figure to the children would also be identified and protected. The Queensland Child Protection Agency already used the Safe and Together model and judges and lawyers are currently being trained by, by the Safe and Together Institute. The foundations of the system aren't changing though. We also need harsh penalties for lawyers, judges, report writers, expert witnesses, who knowingly support perpetrators on a cash for comment basis. Covering up abuse is a crime and the full force of the law, including jail time, should be implemented to de-incentivise protecting perpetrators for payment. We must hold all perpetrators accountable, including individuals and systems who control and abuse women. So, so that it becomes safe 
for women and children to leave domestic, family and sexual violence. Thanks. Thank you so much, um, Janine. It's very much appreciated your your submission. And so now it's time for questions. And I wonder if any of my colleagues, we're sitting here with Kerry Hubel. Bashir Kumar, unfortunately, could not be here because her children are going through the kindergartens or preschool system stage. And I can see the smile on your face, you'll understand. And Mary Kerr and Dr Helen Pringle, who's an Associate Professor at the University of New South Wales. So it's over to us all. Questions? It's a very thorough summary of what's occurring, isn't it? Yeah. Um, well, you go here. Sorry, Kate. No, you, you proceed. I'm still taking it in. And I just, you go. No, 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 no. I, I'm not quite ready yet. <laughs> oh, good. Oh, I am. <laughs> well, what about you, Mary? I know you go to Yeah. Um, I'm really interested in so much of what you said. Um, I'm not sure that I agree that the family court should be closed down, but I think that if we could go back to the original intention of the family court through the Family Law Act of 1975, as it was envisaged by the Attorney General at the time, um, Lionel Murphy, it came in under the Kep Enderby, the next Attorney General, but it was Lionel Murphy's vision, then I think that we could have a chance of reinstating women into the position and children which was intended but your comment about the closed nature of the proceedings you see too often women are led up the garden path with rape it could trials as well, that they should be a closed court when as you point out a closed court is negative to the interests of women. Perhaps you could explain some ways in which, in your observation, the fact that the court is closed and therefore publicity is not being able to be given about what's happening to women and children. You, perhaps you could give some examples from your experience or your knowledge of women who've gone through the system. Thank you. Yes, yes. Definitely uh, it affects the... Um, the proceed, procedurally it, it affects women because um, judges seem, uh, seem to be acting in um, disrespectful ways towards women, uh, the comments judges make, um, and then for, for women to appeal um, and, and they need transcripts for oh, the appeal. Yes. Transcripts are ridiculously expensive. So women can't, especially women who've lost everything financially through um, the family court, can't afford to appeal. So um, judges know this, I, I believe. Um, the way judges speak to victims of domestic violence is, is utterly shocking. Um, it, and it's such a situation of power, um, you know, it replicates the the power dynamic in a domestic violence relationship and unfortunately many judges behavior actual behavior is um is not okay and the closed nature of the court gives them that um ability to or you know behaving in that way judges are able to act with impunity because there's there's no transparency um and because of the separation of power, um, really, it, it is uh, it's the the actions of the judge or being um, under a judge's whim. You know, it's the closed nature of the court, and the, and the nature of the closed court is that journalists can't report on what's happening. So then, the general public doesn't know what's going on in the courts. And, and unfortunately, there's a, an, a, a large element of misogyny and um, gender bias happening that's not being exposed or discussed that affects women and children. Thank you. Thanks, Janine. Um, Can I just make a comment on that? The concept of, of uh, open courts is a concept that's held by most jurists, yet it's, it's not allowed in the family court. 
that is a dichotomy that perhaps not only CEDAW but our own government should be looking at in, because they, they support the concept of an open yeah. court system. Yes. They do not support it in the family law context. Primarily, I think their excuse is to protect women, not men, but in fact, it works the opposite. I, I, yes, and I have actually have a quote here from a, a judge, so a woman who had all finance, all um, assets stripped from her, the, um, the perpetrator had told her that she would lose everything and that was the, you know, that's the nature of coercive control where the perpetrator um, punishes and removes um, all assets and children through post-separation abuse. So the quote from the judge um, when the, um, the woman was explaining the nature of the coercive control and the um, financial decimation, this judge said, oh, oh, okay, and this is part of his coercive control and all he really wants is to get you out of the house and so he'll be rubbing his hands together and twirling his little vaudevillian moustache and saying, aha, and now I'll get what I really want and that is to get Miss so-and-so out of the house. So these are very common um, comments and behaviours that the women I know um, are experiencing. Um, they're being told that they're lying about domestic violence um, so all those tropes about women that that women are crazy when they you know they're they're lying about domestic violence, um, they're mentally ill. All of those tropes are used in the family court, and judges are a part of that um, that bias against women. Um, and women are told by lawyers not to disclose domestic violence in family courts, otherwise you'll likely lose your children. So this is. You know, it's a secret place, it's a secret court where women are being abused and children are being um, sent in, back into danger. Um, and then the mothers who are losing their children to perpetrators are silenced with Section 121 and, um, and, and journalists can't report on it for fear of identifying the, um, the, the um, parties. If I could just say, I think that the reason that closed courts was brought in was because under the old system, when there was fault in relation to divorce and it had to be gained on grounds of adultery, for example, or cruelty, then in fact, what would be exposed was what men were up to. Because I'm not saying women didn't engage in adultery. We know that women did. But the point was, I mean, if a woman engaged in adultery under some under the Victorian law, at least at the time before the Matrimonial Causes Act came in, if the woman engaged in adultery once, then the man could get a divorce, whereas if he, the man engaged in adultery, it had to be multiple times. But to come back to this point, that was about protection for men because what would come out was what they were doing. If it was cruelty, it would be cruelty to the, to the woman. And it's, again, protecting men's interests, as you point out, Janine. But over to uh, Mary or to Helen. Um, I think it was interesting you mentioned about housing because um, if they are, they are stripped of their assets, where do they go if they don't have that financial support from other people or other family members? They're kind of left on their own. So I'd imagine you'd be seeing a lot of that. Yes. Um, so some go to refuges, but, you know, the length of housing, uh, the list for um, social housing, um, women are told, you know, if you have any family member you can go with, stay with. Um, and, and the list is years long so if you've got anyone you can stay with the the people on the list are the people living in tents and cars and and sleeping rough um so housing's a huge issue so people women are staying with family members but it it seems to also be um, a tactic in the family um, court proceedings to strip the, the assets and the home <clears throat> to help with custody. So, you know, if a mother doesn't have a home to house her children, then the children, you know, it's not, you know, that's used as, as another, see, she's <laughs> she's not a good mother. Um, 
So many women stay with family and friends until they can re-establish. But there's no loans for for support. You know, you can get there's small loans for rent and bond um, through um, Nils Loans providers, um, but there's n- there's no structural support basically. Why is there not the recognition that the person who has custody of the children should retain the um, occupation of the matrimonial home? Because the children, if they if they go with the mother and she loses the uh, matrimonial home occupation, they've got to change their schools or their kindergarten. Um, there's all sort of disruption to the children's lives, which really shouldn't be tolerated. And my understanding is that years ago, under this system, that was a, a principle. And because that principle was there, that if you retain custody of the children, the house should come with you, even if there was going to be a settlement at some time in the future in terms of the the uh, property as an asset. And what that led to was men then making applications for custody in order to retain the home. But it sounds to me as if the property aspect has taken over completely without any recognition of the children's rights in particular. But, Helen, did you have something? Um, Thank you very much, Um, Janine. Again, I'm a little bit... um, uh, feel like I've, I've... learned so much, too much, in a way, in a short time. Can you tell me a little bit about what what you think a wraparound approach, other measures, like obviously housing, and what other measures would a wraparound approach um, um, involve? And, and you mentioned the RSL um, president. I think that's really interesting because, you know, that it's, well, it's interesting on two levels, one is it's interesting in, in in ways of thinking about this because we're thinking of these people of of the both the RSL and, and women as kind of survivors of a, a long war, and but it's also interest as an interesting as a practical approach to the measures that we might that we might adopt. So I was very um, I think it's a nice frame as well to, to but what what other specific measures do you think are necessary there um i think we can have a and there's been lots of talk in lots of areas about a, a one-stop shop like a wraparound system um but the very first thing we need is the identification the identification of the predominant aggressor um because the aggr- the perpetrator does use things like smear campaigns in the, in the community um, they triangulate the people that, that that the victim knows. So the victim's already experiencing this in the community that she's the one with the problem. He's a, a great bloke. So we need that first step um, with social workers, psychologists, a, a team of trauma-informed, domestic violence-informed specialists, um, including um, specialist police, that can, you know, sit with the, the um, victim at the very start, before before she leaves or before um, anything happens, to get the the full picture, you know, map the perpetrator's patterns of behaviour, have the evidence, gather the evidence. It's all done at the start rather than at the end of a family court, um, you know, two years of of hearings where she's, you know, been dragged through um, and lost everything, the children. So, you know, keep the the main carer, the mother, with the children and support them. So they're supported to stay in their own homes with funding. Um, the banks understand that that women need support with mortgages through this time. Um, changes to the structure of, of the finance, you know, banking where single mothers are able to own their own homes. It's pretty much an impossibility mm-hmm. unless, you know, a top earner. Um, whereas we don't see that same discrimination against single fathers, I don't think. Um, So if you're a single mother with three dependents um, trying to get a a bank loan for your home, that's near impossible. So the practicalities of funding to wrap around the survivor 
um, and having that legal support so that the perpetrator is removed from the home and the, the criminal justice response to the perpetrator so that the perpetrator is actually going through the justice system and the, the victim and survivors are sort of kept safe and together in their home, in their community, amongst their schools, not being, you know, sent off to relatives who live an hour away from their schools where they have to commute and find housing and, you know, the... You know, I know it's not safe for everyone to leave, but uh, to stay in their own homes. But if we had the criminal justice response and the accountability for the perpetrator, where you know, have a, a, a protection order with teeth, where you know every perpetrator's got a phone, we can the police can track if he's within a kilometre of the the victim. So there's, there's practical measures that we can implement so that the the mother and children are safe and they're recovering and rebuilding in their home, in their community um, with the financial supports they need for a year or two or five or, or six months, whatever it is, um, and then the perpetrator is being rehabilitated, having behaviour change um, programs. You know, he gets the support he needs as well because um, there's very, very few who seem to be um, taking up men's behaviour change programs because there's no acknowledgement of of their perpetration. They really seem to get away with everything they do, and I'm, every victim survivor that I know is in that same situation where there's been pretty much zero accountability for the perpetrator. But even even when there has been criminal charges and the perpetrator has um, had jail time convictions the children are still ordered to live with men, with the end through family court proceedings. It's it's shocking. Um, I, I think that what you've um, said, um, Janine, is, as I said earlier, and so we've all agreed, is really important. I'm just wondering, is there any final questions for Janine? Or issues to follow up now. I should have actually properly introduced her. Mary Kerr is with the police in the Northern Territory, and we're fortunate to have her with us here in Sydney. And Kerry Hubell was the first executive officer of the New South Wales Women's Advisory Council that was set up in 1977, and of course is now a linguist and a teacher of sec English as a second language. And I did um, refer to Helen, Dr. Helen Pringle. Too. Um, if I can just say really quickly, on this issue about the criminal versus the family court proceedings, I know that women were wholly in favour, almost, apart from me, of the introduction of the non-molestation order process. Now, the problem there is that, number one, I know from a, an officer in London, a division of London, they say they don't have the resources to police those orders properly. But number two, which I think is absolutely crucial and which has so often been overlooked, you don't get an order unless you've had criminal action against you and not just one crime. It's going to be multiple instances of criminal assault that's been imposed on that woman before she can get an order. And then if the man breaches the order, it's not actually about the crime committed against her. It's about the insult to the court because it's contempt of court. And so, again, the court is being elevated, a patriarchal institution, above the woman who has been suffering the criminal action. And my position has always been that the police must take action in relation to the crime. The magistrates have to be told that they must treat these matters as criminal acts. And if it goes on appeal, then the judges at the higher level need that as well. But everything that you've said is really powerful and important. So we, we thank you, Janine. And I think it's time for us to... Did you have any final comment before you go and call our next witness? Thank you. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that, with the policing, the, the DBOs, the protection orders, police aren't following up. So that would be a, an enormous change for, that would make huge change. Um, but my, probably my last point or summing up is that we need um, victim survivors with lived experience um, embedded in all the systems. So co-designing, um, working with 
the the government to implement family law changes, to implement pol policing changes. Um, we need to hear the stories of the victim survivors of what happened to them and how they were failed. Because we, you know, we can't change things that we we have don't have the information and the data about. So we really need um, the victim survivors to be embedded in the change. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Janine. Thank you.